What's up, kings and queens? It's your boy Dan from Dark Previews, and I'm back from the dead. COVID took me out for one day. I'm still suffering from some symptoms, but I'm here to preview the three-game slate on the NBA. If it's your first time watching these videos, I do this almost every single night where I share outlier, go through all the key players, all of their matchups, their form lines. I'll tell you what I like. I'll tell you what I don't, and I do all this to give you all the information that you need to make the best bets possible. It's working well for us on the season, close to 70 units on the profit. Now, if that sounds interesting, let's go. So we're kicking things off with the Boston Celtics versus the New Orleans Pelicans. I don't believe there's many um, outs in this game, so everyone seems pretty much available. So let's get straight into it. We'll start with these Boston Celtics. There's a few leans that I already have. Not sure what I'm going to land on, but let's see where we go. We'll start with Jason Tatum, though. There's quite a few markets of his that I don't mind. Will let you know I don't like betting on Jason Tatum, but there's a lot of green on these charts, so we've got to talk through it. So looking at his points prop first. Lines at 25 and a half. He's covered this in nine consecutive games now. It's somewhat difficult match up here against the Pels, who allow the fourth fewest rebounds to power uh, points to power forwards on the season. Although Jason Tatum hit this quite well last two games against the Pels, both of these being this season, scoring 31 and 28 points. So you know that I'm leaning there over on his points prop. The other prop that I'm considering is his first quarter points. Now he's also hit this first quarter point prop in nine out of his last 10 games. In those head-to-head -head matchups, he's covered in two out of his last three. So one of his last two against the Pels. Both of those games were home games for the Boston Celtics. So now on the road um, in New Orleans, I'm a little bit hesitant. I do like his overall points prop, but these first quarter points for it have been hidden for us quite well. So uh, we'll see where we land on that one. Uh, I'm thinking of playing a lot more first quarter props, but maybe just only putting one unit on them and then putting two units on either points, rebounds, or assist props. Uh, but we'll see. I'll call those out in the pinned comment on what I'll eventually land on. Assist props, also something that I'm leaning on. He's hit this in eight out of his last 10 games. In head-to-head -head matchups, he's covered that in two of his last three against the Pels. He had eight assists against them last time. Again, difficult matchup. The Pels allowing the seventh fewest assists to power forwards on the season. And given the matchup, this is why we see his points line and his assist line a little bit lower than what they possibly have been over his last 10 games. But um, definitely something that I'm considering here for Jason Tatum. Um, his rebound prop, that's at seven and a half. I don't like this because it's very inconsistent. Four of his last 10, but he has rebounded well against the Pels this season. 10 rebounds in both of those games. The matchup, it's not too bad. So... Um, overall, I could be considering just a PRA for Jason Tatum, 38 and a half. He's covered that in seven of his last 10, two of his last three against the Pels, those two being his two games this season. So definitely someone he's capable of hitting. It looks like if he's going to go under, most likely he's going to have a terrible rebounding game based on the games he's gone under. Um, and against the Pels, he hasn't had those type of difficulties. So Jason Tatum, PRA, I've got a strong lean on that as well. We're heading into Chris Jarps, Paul Zingas now. He does have a pretty good matchup here against the Pels. Hasn't played them yet this season, though, but he's covered this line of 17.5 in eight out of his last 10, uh, so we do like that. I have a uh, lean on his first quarter points prop because we know like the Boston Celtics love to get Chris Jarps involved in the first quarter. So he's covered this in seven out of his last 10, 16 of his last 20, and on the season, he's hit this from 31 out of 51 games, which is good for a 61% hit rate. So you can also get this at plenty, plus money, plus 110. So I do like that for Kristaps Porzingis. Um, if we're looking at his three-point prop, line's at one and a half. It's minus 166, though, and the matchup's not great. So he has hit this at a 63% rate this season, but at those odds, I'm not feeling it. And his rebound line, it's only at five and a half. He's hit this in six of his last 10. And he's got a great matchup here against the Pels, uh, but yet to verse in this season. So five and a half, bit low for a starting center. You'd have to have massive balls to take their under, under on that one. He's hit the over in this in 69% of his games as well. But at minus 135, I wouldn't be too keen on playing that. So his points prop and his first quarter points prop, they're the two that I've been leaning to for Chris Jobs Porzingis. Now we're jumping into Jalen Brown. Had a pretty poor game against Atlanta. 18 points, but he's covered this line of 21 and a half in seven of his last 10. Once again, difficult matchup. Trey Murphy and Herb Jones defending the wings there for, uh, for the Pelicans. One of them will be picking up Jalen Brown, I'm sure. They do have some length. 
So he's covered in seven of his last 10, but Jalen Brown has covered this in three consecutive games against the Pelicans, which is good. I don't know how confident you guys feel in betting on Jalen Brown, but I'm a little bit hesitant after letting us down in that last game. No, not really his fault. Got into a bit of foul trouble, and then Jason Tatum took over in the fourth. Jalen Brown barely shot, saw, the sh- saw the shots that I'd expect him to take. Uh, if you look at his shot attempts, he had 17 shot attempts in that game, but that's down on his average of 21 in his last 10. In his games against the Pelicans, he's putting up 18.7 shot attempts per game. So based on what he's been doing over his last 10, he should cover this points line. I guess my hesitation in this game is what I found looking through all these props is a lot of these Boston Celtics players, you can't help but lean to the over based with their data in the last 10. Tatum will lean to the over. Chris Stapps will lean to the over. Jalen Brown will lean to the over. We're about to get to Derek White soon too and probably end up leaning to the over for him as well. Um, but yeah, I, I'd lean to the over here for Jalen Brown, but with not as much confidence. Looking at his assist line, that's a two and a half. He's actually covered this in seven of his last 10, has a good matchup, and he's covered this in two of his last three. He did have seven assists against the Pelicans last time, which is pretty crazy, uh, on 13 potential assists. Over his last 10, he's only getting 5.7 potential assists. So I'd lean to the over here in his assist prop for sure, um, but at those odds, it'd have to be something you parlay. I wouldn't take that as a straight bet. Ellen Brown's first quarter props, it's a very really popular option. He has hit this in 69% of games so far this season, but at minus 115, I'm not too keen. The five and a half, not overly excited by that. He's hit it in 16 of his last 20, though. Don't get me wrong. Um, if you bet this every single time Jalen Brown play, plays, you'll be up a fair few units, I'll tell you that. He's hit this in two of his last three against the Pels, but yeah, I'd obviously lean to the over in this one, but man... I also like Tatum's first quarter prop, Porzingis' first quarter prop, Jalen Brown's first quarter prop. So um, it'll be difficult to see all three of them cash in the same game. So you've got to kind of eliminate which one you don't think hits. Oh, God. Um, Jalen Brown rebound prop, five and a half is the line. He's only hit this in four of his last 10, but check this out. He's been killing it against the Pels. 10, 12, and 11 rebounds in his last three games against the Pelicans. In those games... Averaging 14.3 rebound chances. In his last 10, he's only averaging 9.9 rebound chances. So I don't know what it is. Could it be the matchup? Like it it could be worth just putting a small amount here on Jalen Brown on nine plus rebounds or 10 rebounds just to see. But I wouldn't feel comfortable taking the over five and a half, but I might be tempted to take like a high value single here on Jalen Brown for his rebound. So definitely one for me to consider. Having a look at Drew Holiday now. His line's at nine and a half points. He's covered this in seven of his last 10 games. Uh, in the head to head matchup, he's only played the Pelicans once this season. He did score 20 points in that game. He took 11 shots and made seven in 33 minutes. In his last 10, 32 minutes per game, attempting eight shots a game. So, yeah, this is shit. Another Boston Celtics player that I'd lean to the over on points. Like, it's pretty crazy. Lean to the over. Um, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to analyze the box score of the previous games between the Celtics and the Pelicans, see who was in, who was out, what was going on in those games. But I, I can see all of these Boston Celtics going over, right? So <clears throat> looking at his assist prop now, lines at three and a half. Eight out of his last 10 games, he's covered this. Did only have two assists in that last game against the Pels. His rebound lines at three and a half as well. He's hit this in six of his last 10. Tough matchup here. Had three rebounds last time against the Pelicans. Derek White, his points line, 13 and a half. Now, he's covered this in five consecutive games. A lot of those games were without Drew Holiday, but even if you look at his numbers with Drew Holiday, he has cash, started to cash that more recently. Consecutive games over, six out of his last 10. In those head-to-head matchups, two out of his last three against the Pels, he's gone over. Look at Derek White's assist prop, five and a half. He's covered in six of his last 10, one of his last three against the Pels. And his rebound prop. He's been doing an amazing job of this. Look at this. Nine of his last 10. It's a plus money play, plus 124. Challenge, though, he's gone under in three consecutive games against the Pels. Another first quarter prop that I like, Derek White, over two and a half points. He's covered this in eight out of his last 10. And he's also covered this in three consecutive games against the Pelicans. So that's four players now where, where, where I don't mind their first quarter prop. Take a look at these Pellies. Starting off with Zion Williamson. Been killing it as of late with no Brandon Ingram. Lines at 26 and a half. He's covered in seven out of his last 10. He did score 26 points the last time he versed the Boston Celtics. Matchup is difficult though, so we'll see how Zion goes. 
Looking at his assist prop, that line's at five and a half. He's only covered this in three of his last 10. Tough matchup here. Only had three assists against the Celtics last time. He's a plus money play, but you can get pretty decent odds for the under as well. I would lean to the under on this one, but I'd have to dial in a little bit deeper to see the playmaking style. Rebound-wise, six and a half. He's covered in six of his last 10. Only had four boards last time against the Boston Celtics. So you could potentially look at an under for his rebounds plus assists for Zion. So he's hit the under in six of his last 10. Obviously went under the last time he played Boston. Somewhat difficult matchup as well. So yeah, I don't mind that for Zion. CJ McCollum. Now I love the over for his points prop already. What I know is CJ McCollum has been cashing his points prop as of late. And that's because there is no Brandon Ingram. Without Brandon Ingram, his points numbers are crazy. I'll show you that. Look at that. Eight out of his last 10 games without Brandon Ingram. He's, he's cashed. Just this season, seven out of his last nine games, he's gone over in head-to-head -head matchups. Without Brandon Ingram, he scored 38 points against the Boston Celtics. So CJ McCollum over 21 and a half, I'll take. I might even ladder him up 25 and 30 points as well. So I do like that play for CJ McCollum. His assist line at four and a half, that's also seen an improvement without Brandon Ingram. So I'd lean to the over here, but definitely liking the points prop more. Six out of his last 10. He has gone under in three consecutive games against Boston, though. Uh, his three-point prop, which I don't like betting on. I bet him to go over in the last game. He only finished with three. Still took about nine attempts. Yep. Didn't cash for us. I'd lean to the over here, over three and a half. Does have a good matchup, and it correlates well with the three uh, points prop, but definitely like the points prop a lot more. In head-to-head -head matchups, two out of his last three. I made six three-pointers here against Boston, which is pretty wild. And looking at his rebound prop now, three and a half. He's covered this in five out of his last ten and two out of his last three against the Celtics. So CJ points, definitely liking that, considering a ladder up from 25 up to 30 points. Trey Murphy now in the starting lineup. So his points line at 15 and a half. He's only covered this in four of his last 10, despite the increased opportunities without Brendan Ingram, so I don't love it. He's gone under in three straight against Boston. His assist prop, two and a half. He's covered this in six of his last 10, gone under in all three against Boston. And then his rebound prop. That's at, This is at five and a half, and I do like this. I didn't lean to the over on his five and a half rebounds against Milwaukee. He ended up getting 11. So that was a bit of a kick in the face for me. He's only hit this line in two, one out of three games against the Boston Celtics, but he only played 33 and 28 minutes in those games. As of late, you can see he two games playing close to 40 minutes, more opportunities. So I do like his rebound prop. The odds at minus 135 are not great, but I'm going to do some line chopping to see. Another play that I do like as well is his first quarter rebound prop. So check this out. He's cashed this now in seven consecutive games, seven out of his last 10. In head-to-head -head matchups against the Celtics, he's gone under in three straight, but I don't believe he would have been starting in a lot of these games. Well, actually, he would have been starting in these two games, but that was last season. So... Um, I think given the recent form, it's probably worth a play. The matchup's pretty good in terms of rebounding. So front court players have a difficult time getting rebounds against Boston, whereas a lot of these wings and guards, you can get, a, you can get some rebounds given how Boston plays offense. There's a lot of deep deep threes, not deep threes, but a lot of threes attacking the rack. So yeah, Trey Murphy rebounds in the first quarter, I don't mind as well. We've got Herb Jones. Herb Jones had a massive game against Milwaukee. I wouldn't say massive score in the ball, but just his impact on the game was huge. So his points line, he's only covered in two out of his last 10. And the matchup, still somewhat difficult. He's cashed in one of his last two. The main thing I wanted to look at for Herb Jones, though, and I haven't looked at this yet, is his steals plus box. Because uh, defensively, that man's a hawk. Here he is. All right. So his line's at two and a half. Look at this game against Milwaukee. Four steals and three blocks which is pretty wild. Now, Boston, they allow the fewest blocks and the second fewest steals allowed on the season, though. Uh, two and a half plus money here for Herb Jones. Five of his last 10 has cashed in only one of his last two, so I don't like that. I think he still makes a good impact on defense, but you won't see it in steals and blocks. Then the last one's Jonas Valanciunas, so... He played a lot of minutes against Milwaukee, scored 17 points. So 23 minutes when we bet on him, or when I bet on him, he only played 10 minutes against OKC. So a little bit unpredictable. His line's at nine and a half. He's cashed this in three straight against Boston. This is a game where I don't feel he's going to get a lot of minutes unless, you know, he, he plays well. Um, because if Boston do play small, then Jonas Valanciunas is going to be out of place for a lot of this game. Rebound-wise, he's line six and a half. 
He's covered this in five of his last 10, one out of his last three against Boston. Matchup's difficult. Chris Chubb is playing on the outside. Jonas Valanciunas might be hard for him to see some court time in this game. But yeah, look, there's a lot of lines, a lot of leans actually in this game. TJ, I really like. Tatum's got a lot of lines that are pretty good. Derek White. Jalen Brown, his lines are pretty good, but Jalen Brown's left a sour taste in my mouth. Trey Murphy rebounds. Uh, Chris Jobs Porzingis points in the first quarter and his overall points prop. So there's a lot There's a lot that I do like in that game, and we'll check the pin comments um, later, and then that will see all my final bets. Jumping in versus Magic game. Now, I haven't looked into any of these. Um, the lines have just recently become available for this game. Um, looks like there's going to be a few game time decisions based on the number of players that are available. Just have a quick look at the injury report. So obviously the Grizzlies have a lot of people. So now Desmond Bain's out again. Aldama, Chon- Concha, game time decisions. For the Magic, doesn't look to be too many. We've got Marco Fultz that, that is out, but <clears throat> we've got very limited markets. We've only got Suggs, Jackson, Bankera, and Franz available. But let's go through it anyway. Jalen Suggs. His points line, 11 and a half. He's got six out of his last 10. Gone under in three straight games against the Memphis Grizzlies, though. The assist prop, his line is at six, uh, two and a half. He's covered in six out of his last 10. Also gone under in three straight. But a lot of these games, he didn't play a lot of minutes in. So I wouldn't, I'm not even going to look at the historical form, to be honest. The matchup is a good one. So for his points prop, it's not a bad matchup. If we flick through here, we can set the best matchups against the Grizz are probably your centers small forwards, and your point guard. So Jalen Suggs, his matchup's not too bad. If you want to look at his three-point line, one and a half, minus 185 though. Cashing in seven of his last 10 does have a good matchup here. But I don't see myself betting on Jalen Suggs at all. Let's check out Ben Caro. So his line of 21 and a half, he's cashing four out of his last 10. Has had some success against Memphis in the past. Cashing in three consecutive games. In those games, he played 33 minutes, attempted 19 shot attempts. In his last 10, he's playing 34.9 minutes, shot attempts down to 15.5. But over his last four games, has been pretty busy with it, but his shot percentage hasn't been great. So I'm not loving that for Bancaro. His assist prop at five and a half, he's only cashing three of his last 10 and one of his last three against Memphis. So I'm not loving that. And then his rebound prop at six and a half. He has rebounded well, covering in four straight. Six out of his last 10, two out of his last three against Memphis. So <clears throat> if I had to pick a Bankero prop, it would probably be that. But, yeah, I'm not loving it, to be honest. And then we've got Franz Wagner. His points prop, 17 and a half. He's cashing four out of his last 10. It does have one of the better matchups here against the Grizz. But in head-to-head matchups, he's also covered in three straights. So very similar to Bankero, where they haven't been hitting quite well as of late. But against the Memphis Grizzlies, they managed to get busy with it. His assist line, Franz, is at three and a half. He's covered in four out of his last 10, one of his last three against Memphis. And his rebound prop, he's also cashed out in four of his last 10, one out of his last three against the Memphis Grizzlies. So, yeah, I don't know. Do you take Franz? Do you take Bankera to cover their points prop just because they've destroyed Memphis in the past? That might be a good enough reason for you, but, yeah, I'm not feeling it. Jaron Jackson Jr., his points line, 24 and a half. He's covered in five out of his last 10. He's covered in two out of his last three against the Orlando Magic. Uh, I don't know what other props there could be for Jaron Jackson Jr. because he doesn't do too much. Rebound-wise, six out of his last 10. Has rebounded well against Orlando. Three consecutive games he's gone over his rebound prop, but um, six out of his last 10. He's averaging 6.7 rebounds. If you can get five and a half for plus money as well, so I don't hate that. Um, It's just there could be a potential blowout risk in this game. There's a lot of things. Plus, we don't know everybody who's playing, so... I'd be a little bit hesitant to take any bets on that game, if I'm being honest with you. We then have the Milwaukee Bucks against the Atlanta Hawks. So I think when it comes to team changes, there's obviously Giannis and stuff on the game time decision list, but Dame Lillard is out for personal reasons. Now, I think we'll we'll get to it anyway. Let's start with the Atlanta Hawks, and then we'll get to the Bucks. And I'll explain my reasonings and my thought process. Clint Capella. Now, I was foolish enough to fade him on the last last game against Boston. He covered that very early. He's lined at 11 and a half. He's cashed in eight out of his last 10 games. In head-to-head matchups against the Milwaukee Bucks, he's only covered in two out of his last five. He does have a good matchup, though. So the Bucks allow the fourth most points to centers on the season. Now looking at his rebound prop, it's 10 and a half. He's cashed this in six out of his last 10. He's been very close to it. Head-to-head matchups, he's cashed in three out of his last five. 
Um, I'd probably be leaning the over in both, but what I am going to be betting on here is a double-double for Clint Capella. So check this out. So he's cashed a double-double now in nine out of his last 10 games, right? Which is pretty arousing. Nine out of his last 10 games, cashed a double-double. And then against the Milwaukee Bucks, he's cashed in four out of his last five games. The one he didn't cash, I think he had nine points and 10 rebounds or something. So it was very close. Um, minus 105 now. I feel like that line is going to move. I'm actually going to stop recording. I'm going to take the bet now just because that line movement can be a killer. All right, so I just took Clint Capella double-double plus 100. I was using Bet365 for that. Um, I did have a scan across other books. A lot of the other ones are like minus 110, minus 115. So <clears throat> have a look at that as soon as you see this, if you're sitting getting on. But who else have we got in this game? We've got DeJounte Murray. I don't know if you guys watched that last game, but damn, that was crazy. Atlanta beat the Boston Celtics by one. DeJounte scores 44 points on 44 attempts. They, he, he went into that game with a bad back, so I don't know. Look, I'm just letting you know now, I'm not betting on DeJounte Murray in this game. Who knows what you're going to see? He does have a great matchup here against the Bucs who don't defend point cards well. He's cashed this in six of his last 10. One of his last six against the Bucs. He scored 30 points the last time they played in December. His assist line's at eight and a half. Seven out of his last 10 has gone under in two straight now. One out of his last six against Milwaukee. And then his rebound prop, five and a half. He's cashed in four of his last 10. Two of his last six against the Bucs. We've got DeAndre Hunter. So he played quite well in that last game. Last few games, actually. He's been playing all right. So his line's at 16 and a half. He's cashed this in five out of his last 10. Depending if he plays a three or four, somewhat difficult matchup for him. Head-to-head matchups is only cash in one of his last six against Milwaukee. His rebound prop, where is it? Four and a half. He's cashed this in four of his last ten. His last three games, rebounding quite well. In head-to-head matches, covered in three of his last six against the Bucs. I think his three-point prop is worth a look here just because of volume. Yeah, you know, he hasn't covered he hasn't covered against the Bucs before. Zero from six. In his last ten, he's covered in four of his last ten. All right. Now, if we check his attempts, and this is why I said it could be a good play. He's attempting 6.9 attempts over his last 10 games. What I'd be more, if we look at his last five, especially, his attempts per game. Now, the line here is one and a half or two and a half. So, one and a half is minus 225. Over two and a half is 140. He's attempting eight shots, and you might need three. Like, he's shooting at 37%, which isn't great. The Bucs don't defend the three point line as well. Well, they do okay, actually, but in terms of threes and fours and the bigs especially, they don't defend it very well at all. So I think that could be a juicy play, but I don't like betting three-point markets, but I know DeAndre Hunter is going to get his the volume up, that's for sure. Now we head over to Bogdanovich. Now, I've made the mistake of betting his under twice now, and in both of those games against Boston, he went over. Fuck me. But lines at 18 and a half, he's covered this in three of his last 10 games. Head-to-head matchups, he's covered in one of three against Milwaukee. Trey Young's been out for all of this, so data you can see over the last 10. But despite that, he's line at 18 and a half. The matchup is a good one here. The Bucs don't defend guards very well at all. So I'd probably lean to the over on this one. But one thing I do like, actually, I checked this out a bit earlier, is his first quarter prop. So he's cashed in six out of his last 10. Line's at three and a half. Three and a half. He just needs two buckets. So, and what's this? Bogdanovich has exceeded three and a half first quarter points in five of his last six games at home. So thank you, Outlier, for hooking us up with some more details. But yeah, I don't mind that first quarter prop for Bogdanovich. We take a look at his assist lines at four and a half now. He's cashing five of his last 10. He's hitting two of his last three against the Bucs. His three point lines at two and a half. He's hitting six of his last 10 games, two of his last three against Milwaukee. And then his rebound prop, three and a half. He's cashed in six out of his last 10, but he's gone under in three straight against the Bucs. So he does have a good matchup for all of his props here, Bogdanovich. Uh, he's going to get a lot of minutes, a lot of opportunities. But uh, I don't know, DeJounte Murray and how he plays could have a big impact on everybody. But I think Bogdanovich, he'll still get his, he'll still get his options. He'll still get his opportunities, sorry, not options. Let's head over to these Milwaukee Bucks as well. We'll start with Giannis. So a lot of people will think, no, Dame, Giannis has... Um, is expected to blow up. And you can see that in the line. The line's at 33 and a half. Giannis only hit that line in 32% of games this year. The matchup is good against the Atlanta Hawks. Play with a lot of pace, right? There should be points in this game, so Giannis should be able to feast. So Giannis, he's only hit this in 32% of games this season. So we'll fuck around with the filters here, and we'll check out 
how he goes without Dame. And what we can see this season without Dame, five games. He's covered this line in three out of his last five games without Dame Lillard. Minnesota games, a difficult matchup. Utah, not so much a difficult matchup, but he only scored 25 games in the 25 in that game and Milwaukee lost. In this game, the Bucs are four and a half point favorites. So I don't see a blowout occurring, so he should get a lot of minutes. So yeah, I don't yeah, 33 and a half. You've got to have the balls to take that. And I don't have that type of balls on me. Um, but if we want to look at his first quarter points prop, a lot of people have been betting this recently with some success. Line at six and a half. He's hidden six out of his last ten. Um, only his line's at five and a half. No dame. It's been moved up to six and a half. And I don't mind this, but in head-to-head matchups, you can see <laughs> one out of six against Atlanta. So if we have to look at his points prop against Atlanta. Yeah, one out of six against Atlanta as well. If we look at his assist prop, that line's at seven and a half, which is wild. Three out of his last 10. And head-to-head matchups, he's covered in two out of his last six. So if we look at his assist prop, in games without Dame Lillard this season, let's check it out. So Giannis has covered this line of seven and a half in one out of five games this season. This Utah game, he had 11 assists. He only scored 25 points. So that's very interesting. If he's going to go over his points line, chances are he goes under in his assist line. So yeah, seven and a half assists is pretty wild. He does have a good matchup though, but Will Atlanta defend him and force him to push those types of assist numbers out? I'm not too sure. I might just put a, a value play where I try to predict all of Giannis's lines because if there's correlation there, we could get a lot of big odds instead of just playing a single bet on these because the outline quite a bit. If I take his over in points, I'll take his under in assist, for example. Then we can bet a little bit less and hopefully we've read the game right. But if you read it wrong, there's a chance I could lose quite a few units on that. Um, <clears throat> looking at his rebound line, so he's covered this in six out of his last 10 games to have a good matchup here. But the line's at 12 and a half. Against Atlanta, he's covered in two out of his last six. So that's not, I would say, great. Now, Dame probably not a, uh, doesn't move the needle as much with or without Dame, but let's just fuck around with it. So in the five games without Dame Lillard, Giannis has gone under his rebound line every single time. But I don't know if Dame's. Could be could have impact that whatsoever. He would definitely impact the points and assist side of things, but rebounds potentially not. Um, but yeah, for Giannis, I'll probably if I'm gonna lean to the over on his, I, I'll probably lean to the over on his points, under on his assist. To be honest, that's what I'm thinking at the moment. Who else have we got? Fish face for those of you tuning into the last watch party. There's a lot of chat around fish fa- fish the uh, fish face, and that's Chris Middleton. Um, also looks a bit like a goat, but you guys let me know. Uh, at 17 and a half, he's cashed in three out of his last 10, which is not great. Trump's not too bad here against Atlanta. Check out his numbers without Dame Lillard. See his cash, this points line, two out of four games without Dame. So, yeah, somewhat inconsistent. You would assume Chris Middleton would have to get more involved for 17 and a half points. I'm not too sure. If we look at his assist numbers, I did his assist in his last game which did just cash, took the five and a half. That line's now moved to six and a half with no Dame. So he's hit this in six out of his last 10. He's gone under last game against Atlanta. But if we look at his games without Dame for this season, again, that's two out of his last four. So averaging eight potential assists without Dame. Yeah, I'm not too sure. I'm not loving it. So Chris Middleton's numbers with or without Dame, that ain't telling you too much. His rebound line at five and a half, though, has a tough matchup, but his, his last four games have been excellent. Six out of his last 10, only had five boards against Atlanta last time. So nothing for fish face Middleton screaming out to me in this game. Honestly, the person that I'm thinking about who has a big game of no dame is probably someone like Pat Beverly. Pat Beverly's line's unavailable. He's also on the injury list at the moment. He's uh, a questionable on whether he's going to play. If he does, I do like uh, some sort of bet on Pat Beverly. Malik Beasley, his points line 13 and a half. He's cashed in six out of his last 10. He's got a good matchup too, and he's cashed the last two games against the Atlanta Hawks. So this is a play that I don't mind. If you remove Dame from the equation for him, I don't believe you see anything major, but let's check it out. Yeah, so two out of his last five without Dame. Minutes a little bit inconsistent. Shot attempts a bit inconsistent too. But if we look at just his last five games in general, yeah, he's inconsistent with the right matchup. This guy can go off. And we know that in his last two games against Atlanta, he's done exactly that. Played about 35 minutes, 11 and a half shot attempts per game to score 13 and a half points. 
I think so. So I'll add that to my list of liens and I'll investigate that a bit further. Then who else is there? We can have a look at Brook Lopez and we can get the fuck out of here. So his points prop, 10 and a half. He's covered in four of his last 10. Uh, he's covered in oh, six consecutive games now against the Atlanta Hawks, uh, including two games this season, 13 and 11 points. Hasn't been cashing it quite well as of late, though. Um, did play a lot of minutes against the Pels. Didn't get too much shit done. Brook Lopez, rebound prop, four and a half. Six out of his last 10. Three out of his last six against Atlanta. But, yeah, I'm not loving what I'm seeing here for Brook Lopez. Six of his last 10 as well. Two out of his last, uh, four out of his last six against the Hawks. So, yeah, for this particular game, what have I got? Clint Capella, double-double. I know that I like that. I've already placed that bet. Bogdanovich. First quarter and his points prop. I'll investigate that a little bit more. Malik Beasley points prop. I don't mind that as well. That game, the Grizzlies, Magic, not really loving too much. And this Celtics and Pelicans, there's a lot of good form leading into this game for a lot of players. So going to have to be very extra delicate to either eliminate the ones I don't think are going to hit or I just fucking bet them all and see what the gambling gods have in store for me. Before I let you all go, I want to let you know that... um, Looking at another watch party on uh, Sunday night for you guys in the US, Monday morning for those of you in Australia. So I had a look at the slate. There's a lot of games, and there's also a lot of games starting at the same time. So the majority of those games do start at uh, 9 a.m. for me. That's You've got Lakers, Nets, Clippers, Hornets, 76ers, Raptors, Heat, Wizards. And then an hour after that is OKC versus the Knicks, Mavs versus the Rockets, Bulls versus the Wolves. So, And then you've got the Warriors versus Spurs. So in that watch party, I'll dedicate two to three hours, stream, stream the game. We'll jump in between the two. Um, <coughs> jump in between the two and uh, write all these bets. So if you guys are keen on that, let me know in the comment section. Type in your BAPS in your watch party. As you know, the BAPS, I shall create one for today. It's a three-game slate, so hopefully we can come up with something juicy. But yeah, the watch party and the BAP, they're the two things we're pushing it out at the moment. Uh, let me know in the comment section how you guys are doing. I'll catch you guys in the next one. I'm going to get some sleep. Peace. Sub to the channel cause your boy's getting busy Coming to you live from the west side of Sydney We've got the free picks and the juice on the daily It's all free, you don't even have to pay me